Yeah, I'll be reading from John Eldridge's book, Wild at Heart. I'll be in uh, chapter 7. I'm going to be on page 123. The Source of Real Strength. Guys are unanimously embarrassed by their emptiness and one woundedness. It is for most of us a tremendous source of shame, as I've said, but it need not be. From the very beginning, back before the fall and the assault, ours was meant to be a desperately dependent existence. It's like a tree and its branches, explains Christ. You are the branches. I am the trunk. From me, you draw your life. That's how it was meant to be. In fact, he goes on to say, apart from me, you can do nothing. John 15, 5. He's not berating us or mocking us or even saying it with a sigh. All the while thinking, I wish they'd pull it together and stop needing me so much. Not at all. We are made to depend on God. We are made for union with Him and nothing about us works right without it. As C.S. Lewis wrote, a car is made to run on gasoline and it would not run properly on anything else. Now God designed the human machine to run on himself. He himself is the fuel our spirits were designed to burn or the food our spirits were designed to feed on. There is no other. This is where our sin and our culture have come together to keep us in bondage and brokenness, to prevent the healing of our wound. Our sin is that stubborn part inside that wants above all else to be independent. There's a part of us fiercely committed to living in a way where we do not have to depend on anyone, especially God. Then culture comes along with figures like John Wayne and James Bond and all those other real men. The one thing they have in common is that they are loners. They don't need anyone. We come to believe deep in our hearts that needing anyone for anything is a sort of weakness, a handicap. This is why a man never ever stops to ask for directions. I am notorious for this. I know how to get there. I'll find my own way. Thank you very much. Only when I am fully and finally completely lost will I pull over and get some help. And I'll feel like a wimp for doing so. Jesus knew nothing of that. The man who never flinched to take on hypocrites and get in their face. The one who drove a hundred men... <laughs> We, a bundle of cords swung free, the master of wind and sea, lived in a desperate dependence of his father. I assure you, the son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the father doing. I live by the power of the living father who sent me. The words I say are not my own, but my father who lives in me does his work through me. This isn't a source of embarrassment to Christ quite opposite. He brags about his relationship with his father. He's happy to tell anyone who will listen, the father and I are one. John 5, 19, 6, 57, 14, 10, and 10, 10, 30. Why? Why is this important? Because so many men I know live with a deep misunderstanding of Christianity. They look at it as a second chance to get their act together. They've been forgiven. Now they see it as their job to get with the program. They're trying to finish the marathon with a broken leg, but following this closely now, you recall that masculinity is an essence that is passed from father to son. That is a picture, as so many things in life are, of a deeper reality. The true essence of strength is passed to us from God through our union with Him. Notice what a deep and vital part of King David's life this is. Remembering that he is a man's man, a warrior for sure. Listen to how he describes her relationship to God in the Psalms. I love you, O Lord, my strength. Psalm 18, 1. But you, O Lord, be not far off. O my strength, come quickly to help me. Psalm 22, 10. O my strength, I watch for you. You, O God, are my fortress, my loving God. Psalm 59, 9 through 10. And we got some interesting stuff going on here. Maybe that's all it was. I dare say that David could take on John Wayne or James Bond any day. Yet this true man is unashamed to admit he's desperate dependence on God. We know we are meant to embody strength. We know we are not what we were meant to be. 
and so we feel our brokenness as a source of shame. As we spoke of his wound recently, and how he needed to enter into it for healing, Dave protested. I don't even want to go there. It all feels so true. Men are typically quite harsh with the broken places within them. Many report feeling as though there is a boy inside and they despise that about themselves. Quit being such a baby, the others, the, they order themselves. But that is how God feels. But that is not how God feels. He's furious about what happened to you. It would be better to be known and to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around the neck than to face the punishment in store for harming one of these little ones. Dang. Luke 17, 2. Think of how you would feel if the wounds you were given, the blows dealt to you, were dealt to a boy you loved, your son perhaps. Would you shame him for it? Would you feel scorn that he couldn't rise above it all? No, you'd feel compassion. As Gerald Manley Hopkins wrote, My own heart let me more have pity on. Let me live to my sad self hereafter kind. In the movie Goodwill Hunting, there is a beautiful picture of what can happen when a man realizes he has owned his wound and discovered he doesn't have to. Will Hunting, played by Matt Damon, is a brilliant young man, a genius who works as a janitor at MIT and lives in a rough part of town. No one knows about his gift because he hides it behind a false self of tough kid from the wrong side of the tracks. He's a fighter, a violent man. That false self was born out of a father wound. His original father he does not know, and the man who was his foster father would come home drunk and beat Will mercilessly. After he's arrested for getting into a brawl for the upteenth time, Will is ordered by the court to see psychologist Sean, played by Robin Williams. They form a bond. For the first time in Will's life, an older man cares about him deeply. His initiation has begun. Toward the end of one of their last sessions, Sean and Will are mm, talking about the beatings he endured, now recorded in his case file. Will, so uh, you know, what is it like? Will has an attachment disorder. Is it all that stuff? Fear of abandonment? Is it why I broke up with Skylar? Sean, I, I didn't know you had. I did. You want to talk about it? No. Hey, Will, I, I don't know a lot, but you see this? This is not your fault. Yeah, I know that. Look at me, son. It's not your fault. I know. It's not your fault. I know. No, you don't. It's not your fault. I know. It's not your fault. All right, it's not your fault. Don't mess with me. Sean, not you. Sean, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. Will collapses into his arms, weeping. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It is no shame that you need healing. It is no shame to look to another for strength. It is no shame that you feel young and afraid inside. It's not your fault. Frederick, we'll leave it there. That went to uh, page 123 to 127, uh, healing the wound. The source of real strength. All right, see ya.